Columbus or like alternative uh, perspectives of others and, and just, you know, just different viewpoints of a theory. There's only so much of that you can do in high school or in, in K-12. You've got to... K-12 education should be where kids are getting the basics. You know, it, you, you've got to give kids a certain common referent and then you can go out after you get out of school or elsewhere, you know, and learn other things. Certainly there's, there's no, it's, you know, this isn't like Russia or China where we're prohibiting you from learning things. The lovely thing about this country is that you do have access to a lot of other sources of information. But I think we would be doing students, I know more about science class than history or other things, so I'm going to stick to that. I think sure. we'd be student, doing students a real disservice if we presented them with standard um, science, say, you know, here's the evidence that the uh, sun goes around the, uh, or that the earth goes around the sun, and here's the evidence that the sun goes around the earth. Uh, you know, let them let them choose. Or evidence that here's the evidence that the uh, that the earth is 6,000 years old. Here's the evidence that the earth is billions of years old. Yeah. I think we'd be doing students a real disservice to that. And and I'm not talking. Not that you're talking. You know, you're not. You're not favoring geocentrism. You're at 6,000 years old, but. Even what comes to mind is like mutations and beneficial mutations. Um, like it never occurred to me that 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 um, in certain senses we've never experienced a beneficial mutation. And, and of then, course we do. Of course we do. I mean, what if you read a high school biology textbook? Um, hopefully, what they're teaching is that the majority of mutations are neutral. neutral some, maybe. some, yeah. The majority of mutations are the majority of point mutations. Are, are, are neutral substitutions that don't make any difference in the phenotype. And, the, um, and a very small percentage of mutations um, have, are, are negative and a small percentage are, 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 are beneficial. Uh, averaged over a large population, uh, you end up with an opportunity for a selection. I, I think it would be a small thing to say, you know, a lot of people feel that there's never been a beneficial mutation. Well, yeah, but if you did, you'd be really teaching people very bad science, because that would be uh, that would that would be, you know, maleducation. Um, yeah. Can I ask something about your chapter about the polls? Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in this, and just wanted to get your view of it. And I bought the book, and I'm going to read the chapter. But um, can you just give me a really quick sense of what do you think? the general public say, let's just stick with the United States for now, is um, what, what the percentage is, and I realize it's how you ask the question. Polls very consistently have shown less than is half. It, is it going down, or is it, do you know what the trajectory is? Very consistently for about 20 years, the, the numbers have remained very constant, that around mid to high 40% of okay. the United States reject evolution. And you would, you would say those, that's a, Realistic. Yeah. Offer. Yeah. You. But you know, obviously, it depends on how you ask the sure. questions. Well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's getting pretty close yeah. to closing time. I think we should probably run. Don't you think we should? It's up to you. Oh. Okay. Well. Because um, um, you um, in the back. Yeah. One question for the young earth creationist here. Um, I just want to make the point that mutations can only be viewed as neutral, negative, or positive in the setting of an environment, okay? A phenotype can, it can be negative or positive or neutral depending on the environment in which you place it. C-sickle cell anemia. Uh, Computer. Yeah, yeah so, so you really do need to, when you consider a phenotype and the genotype putting into that, you do need to absolutely consider the environment. I think it's an important point. Just, just make a point based on fundamental good biology. Right. Sir. I just got a flu shot, and one of the things that I was advised in reading in the background of it is that the flu virus is constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that an example of evolution? I also read um, about a, a farmer who was uh, himself a fundamentalist Christian who was applying, uh, who was frustrated because the pesticide that he was using on his cotton crop was no longer killing the boll weevil because the boll weevil had undergone some evolution. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what my question is that. Uh, there's an obvious, um, there's an obvious reason to study evolution because we, if we don't know that evolution is happening, um, 
the bugs are going to take over, shall we say. <laughs> the virus is going to catch us, and we're going to fall farther and further behind. Uh, so it's clear why uh, there's a tremendous effort uh, in this country and others uh, in favor of, of getting a better understanding of evolutionary mechanisms and the whole theory that runs behind it. But what I don't understand is, apart from individuals whose uh, philosophical and religious beliefs are opposed to this, where are the social forces that don't want evolution to look? Where is the money coming from behind creationism? Why do they want to block science? What, where, where is the economic interest behind this? Is it coming like from candy companies or, or what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it's mostly from small donations. I'm sorry? Um, the, financially, it, it's primarily from, well, opposition to evolution comes largely from, um, f for religious reasons. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, very few people will show up at the school board meeting to raise hell because they don't like the Cambrian explosion. I mean, that's really not a motivating factor. It's, you know, it's because of religious opposition to what their kids are being taught. Um, and there, there, there are organizations like the Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis and, and a whole raft of smaller organizations throughout the country, which appear to be funded primarily by small donations, lots and lots of small donations, individuals sending in small amounts every month. Um, some churches have uh, ICR or AIG as their, um, uh, as their mission. Um, you know, like, so once a month, uh, the collection for that month will go to ICR or AIG or something. Uh, there are some private foundations that donate, uh, or individuals will donate stock or something like that. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a big heavy duty, big corporation kind of thing. Um, I think it's it's primarily funded by, you know, small, um, small individual donors. Dread. I was very, very grassroots. No, very grassroots kind of thing. I was hoping there's someone we could boycott. No. <laughs> no, just no, indivi sincere individuals. Yes. Where are we so different from other countries such as Western Europe? There's such an irony between the fact that here we have our First Amendment in, in Western Europe. They have established religion. They have established state churches that, well, churches happen to be empty, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, one thing is the, look at the history of Christianity in this country versus um, um, other places. In the United States in the 19 teens, uh, was the invention of a particular form of Protestantism called fundamentalism. And it was during about, I think about 1915 to 1918, um, <clears throat> uh, a series of uh, 12 pamphlets were commissioned called the Twelve Fundamentals. And those booklets were uh, formed the basis of this new kind of very back to basics uh, Protestantism called fundamentalism. And they were commissioned by um, a group of, uh, actually, um, businessmen down around uh, Baptist Institute of Los Angeles, which later became Biola University. And these were um, uh, written by a group of conservative uh, clerics, uh, um, ministers of the time. And they were circulated all over the country to um, Protestant ministers and um, um, uh, seminaries and they became very very influential and of course they hit just at a time uh, right at sort of that you know World War World War one the Great War a time of great social unrest and people were really looking for something to kind of grasp onto that, that would give their lives meaning and you know this very kind of more uh, biblical inerrancy form of, of Protestantism seemed to really resonate with with Americans um, interestingly enough, if you look at the treatment of evolution in the original fundamentals, it was not as um, it was not as, as hardened as it later became in fundamentalism. Fundamentalism later became much more biblically literalist than it was in the original twelve fundamentals. You you can buy the you know you can buy a book of the twelve fundamentals and read all this. Um, uh, Karen Ar Armstrong has got some very good uh, history on this. She's she discusses uh, this in some of her books. 
but um, fundamentalism never really uh, took root any place else except North America. Uh, it's a pretty much uh, American and to some degree Canadian kind of religious tradition. And uh, it has tended to color American Protestantism much more so than uh, Christianity outside of the United States. So American Christianity is a much more conservative Christianity than what you would find in Europe or Great Britain. And because of that, we've tended to have many more of these anti-evolution movements, which, I mean, you know, the Scopes trial was 1925, that was right after the establishment of fundamentalism, after all, and, and uh, growing right out of that. And of course, American religious history has been quite fascinating in and of itself. I mean, consider the great awakenings of the 1830s and so forth and so on. We've always had much of a, um, a very congregational, in the sense of non-hierarchical religious tradition here. So um, uh, I would say, like everything else, why, why do we have this problem here? It's history and tradition, <laughs> just like everything else. And I think we have to consider religious history. And also the fact that we have a very decentralized education system here. Uh, if you look at Great Britain and on the continent, they have much more of a centralized uh, education system where decisions as to what's going to be taught is made uh, by the central hierarchy. And they're much smaller countries as well. We have this huge, vast country. Um, I mean, you know, what's taught in, in Berkeley is very different from what's taught in El Cerrito. And we're right next to each other. Right? Um, and as a result of having these local elected school boards, education ends up being very politicized in the United States. We have these elected, that's a very important point, elected school boards. So they're looking over their shoulders who's making the most noise, and the ones who are making the most noise are often the religious conservatives who are very concerned about what their kids are going to be taught. So they have a disproportionate effect upon uh, what gets taught, and that is often not evolution. So anyway, thank you so much for coming out.